Ahaz didn't want to trust the Lord. He refused to ask for a sign. He refused the Lord's salvation. And the Lord says, nonetheless, I will save you. That is a picture of humanity. That is a picture of humanity. The story of the Old Testament is God coming again and again and again and again to save his people and to tell them the path of the salvation and to to turn to him and to know him. And for brief moments they do, but then so quickly they turn away. Have you ever wondered about why that is? Why is it that we are looking forward to the new? Why is it so powerful? Dopamine? (laughs) Every little hit of new is exciting. Yeah, but then why is it exciting, isn't it? Because it it shapes us, it manipulates us. Advertisers use it constantly. Uh, It stops us from being content. Uh, We're on this search for the new. Have you ever wondered about why that is? I put it to you because actually God has put a thing in our heart to recognize, to be discontent with what we have. But the tricky thing is we look for that new in the wrong place. What I want to help you see this morning is this incredible new work of God in the coming of Jesus, which really defines newness for us and ought to reshape our expectations of what we should look for in what is new and why it matters. So I think about the new act of God. And the first thing you see in this passage is that it's a holy act. So you might have, as, as, as Nico um, kind of um, compelled us to have, Matthew chapter 1 open, uh, that'll be helpful, <laughs> looking at verse 18. Matthew actually picks up on the same language as Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. It, it says, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. It actually is, this is the origin story. This is the Genesis story of Jesus the Messiah. It's connecting to 1.1. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Um, We we miss a little bit here. um, The language there of pledged to be married or betrothed, um, or we might say engaged, but it's stronger than most of our language. Um, it's actually, they are committed in marriage together. It, they, they are not yet married. They have not yet moved into the same home. Um, the reason we know it's so strong is you see that um, Joseph's going to divorce her quietly, release her. If he's going to divorce her quietly, it's as if they were already married. And every, uh, every good story you know, has an has a, has a tension or a conflict point. And here it is. Mary is pregnant from the Holy Spirit. Now, we know that story because where the, the text tells us. But you've got to think about poor Joseph there for a moment. He is pledged. He has committed himself to this woman. He's as good as married to her. And he knows that nothing's happened in the bedroom. And now she's pregnant. What should he do? What should he do? It's a pretty big tension point. Now Joseph could have divorced her publicly. But he's going to do it quietly. You can see there the tension point. He's planning to commit his life to this woman. And now, can he trust her? But verse 20, God intervenes. After Joseph had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Um, the language there considered means that Joseph is like, he's, he's ruminating on it. This is like, this is a big deal to him. He's worried about what he should do. Um, should he publicly divorce Mary? Um, that would be appropriate. Um, since the Romans came in, they no longer stoned people for adultery. Um, but there were still public courts of disgrace. It was such a dishonor. But Joseph needs to do that. He's considering it. And an angel appears to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is, is from the Holy Spirit. There's two big points here. It's the do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, Joseph. 
Why? This is a new act of God. In fact, this is a holy act of God. You can't see it again in the English, but there's an emphasis on the holiness of the Holy Spirit here. This is from the Spirit who is holy, is the way the text lays it out. Joseph needs to understand this is a holy act of God. It's the very opposite of being afraid. He should be rejoicing. Let's hit some quick implications. Um, One, is this scientifically possible? Well, C.S. Lewis, who wrote the Narnia series, deals with this brilliantly. Um, First, he makes the point that obviously the ancient people were not naive. The reason Joseph is going to divorce Mary is he realized people don't just magically get pregnant. Uh, It just doesn't happen that way. It's not that the ancient people suddenly believed that everyone could just randomly get pregnant. They weren't naive. So that's why he goes to divorce her. He's not an idiot. But is it possible that Mary might be pregnant without Joseph? C.S. Lewis says it very helpfully. Let me just read it out. C.S. In the normal act of generation, the father has no creative function. A microscopic particle of matter from his body and a microscopic particle from the woman's body meet. The human father is merely an instrument, the last in a long line of carriers. That line is in God's hand. It is the instrument by which he normally creates man. No woman ever conceived a child without him. I think that's brilliantly put. Because it, it's true, isn't it? If you think about it, the man and the woman, they don't actually, they do an act. <laughs> there's sex that's held, but there's no, they don't do anything to make those two microscopic particles become a new life. How is it that those two microscopic particles, one an egg and, oh, anyway, I've forgotten the technical language, something has deserted me. How is it that that creates life? Rachel's laughing at me just because she's done three years of study. How is it that they create life? Anyone who's had the heartache of wanting children but hasn't been able to have them realizes that actually something amazing must happen for life to start. But what makes the virgin birth of Christ different from every other birth is that God just chose to bypass his traditional method. And yet he's still doing his very same thing of bringing life. C.S. Lewis says this, once his life-giving finger touched a woman without passing through the ages of interlocked events. He is now doing small and close what he does in a different fashion for every woman who conceives. He does it this time without a line of human ancestors. But even where he uses human ancestors, it is not less he who gives life. I think that that's very powerful. I mean, one of the great questions in the whole universe is how did life begin? Even with the Big Bang and the explosion of matter, we're searching for how did we go from non-life to life? The answer is the very finger of God. But why did God do this? Do it this way? Well, the emphasis here in the text is it was through the Spirit of God. But the emphasis here is through the Holy Spirit. See, all of creation from Genesis chapter 2, it's actually the Spirit of God who poured out into us that enables us to have life. It's only because God's Spirit is at work that we have life. But here, God brings life, but it's holy life. God's plan was a holy one. And actually, we're supposed to see this as a new act of creation. We're supposed to kind of link it to Genesis and see that God is almost starting the process of humanity again. It's a new act of creation. The Holy Spirit is with Jesus from womb to tomb with a new holy act. And I think Joseph gets it. It's why in verse 24, what Joseph does. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He took Mary home as his wife, so at which point now they are married. When she leaves her father's home and comes into his home, now they are united as one flesh. It's Genesis 2. You shall leave your parents one flesh, come home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. Joseph knew that it was, he didn't want any questions about the origin 
of Jesus. If he had consummated their marriage together, if he had slept with her, the question would be, maybe, maybe Jesus really is Joseph. But God does two things. He makes sure that Jesus is in Joseph's line. He's now adopted into Joseph's family. He's now a son of David legally. But he's the new act of God. Think about this new act of creation for a moment. It's a new act of creation. Just step back for a moment. We t- if you've been Christian for a while, you might take it for granted. But it's a new act of creation. It's unlike anything else that's ever happened in the universe before. Yes, God has made life from non-life. But think what's happening here. The one who gives life has put himself into the very thing he's created. He enters into his creation. He makes himself a part of what he has created. The whole history of the Old Testament, in many ways, is how God stands over and above and outside of his creation. He's master of it all because he created it. And here, God comes incarnate, takes on flesh. Jesus, second person of the Trinity, takes on human flesh and enters into creation. Tried to think about how to illustrate this. Can you imagine, can you imagine the writer of a TV series or a movie writing themselves into their own movie, putting themselves um, with the characters in that movie series on an equal footing? It's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a strange idea, isn't it? But that's what God has done. He's entered in to this world like, a char- like the writer entering into the movie. And now the characters can do whatever they like. This is what the Lord did. Well, why this holy act? The next sentence tells us the reason. It's a great saving act. Verse 21, Mary will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Boom, so much there, right? So Jesus is the Greek version of Joshua. Now, I discovered something this week. I hadn't ever discovered this before. Um, Often we translate Joshua as the Lord saves, but actually it's a little different. It's actually even more direct. It actually means Yahweh is salvation. Yahweh is salvation. It's a saving act. Yahweh is salvation. What will he save people from? Their sins, verse 21, because he will save his people from their sins. Now, I'm just sure, what sure you think about sin, what you think it is, how significant you think it is. Being Christian for a while, you probably think it's very, it's quite significant, maybe even very significant. But think about how significant this context makes it. The Lord Yahweh enters into creation. The Creator becomes part of creation to save His people from their sin. Can you see how significant God thinks sin is? How deadly and dangerous it must be from God's perspective. Think again about the scriptwriter, right? The scriptwriter has written his TV series, his movie series, and suddenly he sees his characters are under threat. Got a couple of options. He could kill them all, rip up the script. But what if he realizes the only solution is to, the planned solution in God's case, but the solution is to enter into the script himself so that he might save his characters? Could you conceive of a movie writer or a TV writer doing that? Giving up their power and their authority, their freedom over the script to enter into it and make themselves one of the characters to save their characters? But that's what God does. Because he wants to rescue us from sin. I put it to you, This shows us just how dangerous sin is. 
And this shows us, right, the sin recognises that we might save ourselves. We might save ourselves from a lack of education, from lack of money, from lack of friends, from lack of influence. We can save ourselves from all those things. But this very story, the way it's framed, says that it is impossible for us to save ourselves from sin. The very sending of Jesus by the Holy Spirit as this new act of creation in the world shows the impossibility of us without him dealing with sin. In other words, you might not think sin is a problem. God does. (laughs) Flashing lights, sirens, sin is a problem. What is sin? Well, in summary, it's the decision to choose life in our own terms rather than on God's. And this means we are far from God and we cannot be with him. In summary, it's a saving act. It's a holy act of God, a saving act of God and a plan and promised act. Matthew chapter 1, verse 22. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Uh, the word fulfill, uh, people often think of Matthew's gospel as the fulfillment gospel. There's, I think, 90, mm, can't remember exactly, I think there's 52 quotes of the Old Testament in Matthew's gospel and something like 250 allusions to Old Testament events. Matthew's written this to help us see that God is bringing about his great plan and his great promised plan. Verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet and the prophet is Isaiah. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Matthew's quoting Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. The context as... um. Nico shared with us is quite remarkable. These two kings, the king of Syria, the country north of the nation of Israel, and then there's the king of Israel, which were, the kingdom was split. It was the kingdom of Israel that split into Judah and Israel, two tribes south, ten tribes north. And now these kind of brothers, the ten northern tribes, are going to go to war against Judah, against Ahaz the king. And so Isaiah goes up to Ahaz and says, the Lord will protect you, the Lord will save you, Ask for a sign from the Lord to prove it, whether it be as deep as Sheol or as high as the heavens. Now, the signs in the Bible are ambiguous. Signs and miracles are ambiguous across the Bible. They sometimes lead people deeply astray. Sometimes people ask for them because they fail to trust. Here, Ahaz is being told by the prophet of God, Ahaz, I want you to show how certain, I want to show you how certain this future is how much God loves you, how much God cares for you, how much God will protect Judah. So Ahaz, I'm telling you, ask for a sign. Ahaz's response is, I'm not going to do it. He says it's wrong. He says it's wrong to put the Lord to the test. What's going on? I think it shows that Ahaz refuses to trust that the Lord will save. That ultimately, Ahaz refuses to trust that the Lord will save. And in this context, God does something. The Lord says something utterly remarkable. He says, I asked you to ask for a sign. But since you refuse, I will give you a sign. I will give you a sign. And that sign is that a virgin will give birth to a child who will be called Emmanuel, God with us. And can you see the significance of the sign, God with us? It means to be under God's protection, to be saved, to be cherished, that God will guard you. Now, it comes in the context, um, the the two or three chapters of Isaiah are all about children with strange names. If you read Isaiah through 7 through to 9, it's all about children with strange names. Emmanuel, uh, then the, the child of Isaiah is a child called the prey will soon be caught. So he has a child born that says the prey will soon be caught, which is all about um, the nations being crushed by the Assyrian king. Uh, and then another king is promised in Isaiah 9. So the, but the prophecy is, is there and, and people were asking the question, is this the king? But think about the significance. 
the Lord says, I'm going to prove to you that I can and will save you. A virgin will give birth. Here is my sign that I am the saving God. A virgin will give birth. Now, a little side note here. Uh, the Hebrew word isn't the usual word for virgin. It's an unusual word. I think it's used six times in the Old Testament. But I think it's probably more striking because of that. And in fact, it sometimes gets used of a young girl, like it gets used of Moses' sister. It's trying to, I think it's supposed to draw our attention to the youngness of this woman, or not the youngness of the woman, the, the, the distinction of this woman. A virgin will give birth. But not only that, the child will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. The name of the child is the declaration that the Lord is with the nation of Judah, that he'll protect them and that he will save them. And there's no surprise then that Matthew brings that to apply for Jesus because in Isaiah 9, to us a child is born, to us a son is given through the Davidic line. He shall be called Everlasting Father. He'll be called Mighty God. God is going to be with us through a child. And so Matthew kind of looks back and sees that this must be the answer. But again, think about what God is doing here. A virgin is conceiving a new act of God in line with always bringing life and yet a new act of God. He does a new thing. There are no other records in the Old Testament of a virgin giving life. The very newness, I think, of that is to show the radical new act that God is doing in the world. But notice the context again. It's the Lord's sign for who? It's the Lord's sign for Ahaz who refuses to trust him. The Lord gives a sign to Ahaz when Ahaz refuses to trust the Lord. It's powerful. Jesus is the fulfillment of that sign. Who is he the saviour of? He's the saviour of those who refuse by themselves to trust in the Lord. Ahaz didn't want to trust the Lord. He refused to ask for a sign. He refused the Lord's salvation. And the Lord says, nonetheless, I will save you. That is a picture of humanity. That is a picture of humanity. The story of the Old Testament is God coming again and again and again and again to save his people and to tell them the path of the salvation and to, to turn to him and to know him. And for brief moments they do, but then so quickly they turn away. That's, that's the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. God's free to eat from any tree. But do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And yet, we refuse to trust God in his salvation. But what is God like? How good is he? And how much does he know we're at peril? He gives this sign that he chooses to save even those who refuse his salvation. So when Jesus comes, he comes in the story of the Jews who are still in exile. The reason the Romans rule over them, as we'll see as you keep reading through Matthew's gospel, in a sense, that pattern that we saw last week of Abraham to David, David to the exile and exile to the Messiah, they are still in exile. They are still the people who have refused to come under God. So Jesus comes as the sign to them. God wants to save you. You need saving. And he comes even for those who, in a sense, refuse his salvation. And he calls out to us, will you not come to Jesus to be saved? God, the Lord, is saying to us as clearly as he can, that in the coming of Jesus is the one who is the Davidic king, is the one who is the Messiah, and he is the one we desperately need. Because God had did something that he had never done before. Gave life through a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit 
to be a new act of creation. Why? So that he might be with us and that we might be saved from sin. Let me conclude. When we want to fill our life with new things, when we feel a bit dissatisfied with the old, there's a sense where that is exactly right. Because actually we're looking for this newness. We're looking for this new relationship with God. We're looking for God with us. That's the great ache of our souls. But the problem is when we keep looking for it in the wrong place. It won't come from the new house or the new car or the new relationship or the new Netflix episode. It won't come from the new body or the new pattern or the new life from ourselves. It actually comes when we see the great newness that God brings in Jesus, that he was the great new act of God that brings the new life we need.